Grab your Bibles. We are in a sermon series titled The Unexpected Journey. For those of us sitting here today, our journey, we've agreed, isn't really what we expected it to be. It isn't really what we had planned, and yet God in His sovereign orchestration says, I got you right where I want you. You just got to walk with me. You've got to trust me, even if you don't like it. I need you to journey with me. We're learning what it means to carry on through the Holy Spirit what Jesus began. We learned last week four really key principles that I, want to, that I want to talk about a little bit. We know the early believers, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They set themselves under the leadership of the church, and they said, tell us, tell us how to do this. Show us who this Jesus is. They were devoted to koinonia with each other. We talked about this Greek word that means to be in each other's lives, to be in community, to be sharing. Koinonia. You've got to be in each other's lives to know how to pray for each other. You've got to be in each other's lives to know how to love each other and to journey together. This is what they were doing. They were sharing meals. They were doing this in prayer. They were doing this on purpose. And so we took some, to, we took some notes from the early church, and we're going to be able to apply it in our own lives. They were basically just putting their money where their mouth was, and they were living this out. I, I've titled this week's sermon, Power in the Name. Power in the Name. See, when something out of the ordinary happens, we'll go with the word supernatural. It begs us to ask a question, what just happened and how? See, because we like to explain things, don't we? And sometimes, most often with supernatural, we just can't explain it, which is why it's supernatural. So let me ask you a question before we get going too far. Uh, do you still believe that Jesus still performs miracles and healings? Yeah, so we can agree on that. So this church firmly believes that. The Bible firmly teaches that. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to see a story of one of the miracles, just one of the miracles that God did in Acts. And God didn't stop doing these miracles in Acts, but we're going to study this one because it's pretty, there's some pretty powerful ideas that we can grab from this. Just so you know, the sermon is part narrative, part historical, and part application. It's kind of a full package deal. And I'm really excited to be able to bring you the Word of God this morning. At the end of the day, I want each and every one of us to, su to submit to the sovereignty of God. See, because God doesn't always heal. God doesn't always do miracles. As a leadership team this morning, we stood right back there praying for healing for two specific people. Because we believe that God can heal. We really, really do. And when He chooses not to, we still have to trust Him. So today's, today's sermon is all about watching the power of the name of Jesus Christ do what it can only do. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, I give you an abundance of thanks for the opportunity to sit under your teaching this morning. God, I pray that you would use my mouth to share your truth and your heart for this matter. God, I thank you that we get the chance to be together. And I pray, God, that we would take this message and run. We would, we would apply it. God, and as you can only do to open our spiritual eyes and ears to see and to, and to hear what you're teaching us, I pray you would do that right now. And then we would walk confidently and humbly in you. Be with us this morning, Jesus, in your name. Amen. We'll be in Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. I'll be reading out of the ESV. Verse 10 verses. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, ninth hour. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and they said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I've got no silver or gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder. 
and amazement at what had happened to him. Let's just dive right in. Verse 1, now Peter and John, they were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Luke just told us all these signs and wonders. We studied it last week. All these signs and wonders were going on. We looked at our own little church here about what God has supernaturally done in the last almost year of our lives together. We even had testimonies of people proclaiming the miracles that God has done for us. So Luke is painting us this perfect picture that Peter and John are now going up to the temple. And, and the focus is still on Peter. He's listed first. He's their primary spokesperson. So he's listed first. And you're going to learn throughout the first 13 chapters or so of Acts that it's Peter and John, these were two cohorts together. These were brothers in arms, if you will. They did a lot of ministry together. So you'll hear a lot of, lot of stories about these two guys. And it says they were going up to the temple. Well, just so you know, it's a very mountainous region. And so when it says they went up to the temple, it's because they took the top of a mountain and basically cut it off, and they shaved it off, and they built the temple on top of it. So you always had to go up to the temple. You never went down to the temple because it was physically elevated. So it says they were going up to the temple, so there's stairs to get up there. So that's where they were headed. And, and the way that it was written, it's in what's called the past progressive form. You might not care, but it just means in the actual language that this is something that they did regularly. This wasn't a one-off deal. They went to the temple every day. This is what they did. They still considered themselves to be Jewish. They went to the temple twice a day to pray. They were doing this. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. That just means 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's what this means. I'm still not sure why they don't translate it that way for those of us that don't speak in that terminology, but... Just so you know, that means 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's nearing nighttime. And so they would have one last sacrifice for the day. They'd have one more time of prayer for the day as a community. And then they would go home to their meals. So they're headed up for their, for their last prayer time, their prescribed time for prayer. It, what's crazy is there was always more people historically that would go to the temple in the evening time for prayer than in the morning. And so again, God in his supernatural sovereignty has a very large crowd yet again. Not a bad time to witness about the truths of Christ. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called Beautiful Gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Okay, you can't make this stuff up. God's timing is absolutely perfect. And a man lame from birth whom they carried. This timing thing, I don't want you to miss any of this. God was lining up this encounter. The guy wasn't laid there an hour before. He wasn't laid there the day before. He wasn't laid there after they walked into the temple. He's being laid at this exact time. God's timing. God's timing we have to trust because we can't make this stuff up because we only see in part. We have no idea the big picture. So God at one point is bringing a lame man being carried in from people. We don't know who they are. So they're bringing him to this gate at the exact same time that Peter and John are about to walk up. Can you see how God lines things up supernaturally? Do you see this going on already? We have to, this, this is for us kids. Listen to me. We need to always trust God's timing. You've heard it said it's cheeky, right? God's never late. He's always on time. Well, that's not exactly comforting when things aren't going your way. When things are going sideways and you're confused or you're hurt or you're broken or you got nothing left, this is when we need to go back to stories like this. Biblical stories of trusting God's timing that he's lining things up that we can't even see yet. We know from chapter 4, which we'll study here in a few weeks, this guy had been lame for over 40 years. He never walked. Lame from birth. Four decades of being carried to the temple. We are to understand the way that Luke wrote this. This man's condition couldn't be fixed with a couple of ibuprofens. This guy was completely lame and had been for over four decades. So we're, it's pretty dire. This guy's been suffering for a very, very long time. It's pretty common in the first century that people that were lame, they were never taught a trade. They were just beggars. They didn't waste their time in their mind giving them a trade because they didn't really value them as a society. So they would just bring them and you beg. That's, that's kind of how the first century worked. And whom they laid daily. This means that every day somebody brought him to the temple. Every day he laid here. Same guy, probably at the same gate. This means that people would have obviously known who this guy is. They're used to him. They've seen this guy quite a bit. 
They, he would have been watching all of them go in and out of the temple while he just laid there. They would have probably been used to him begging, most likely. Oh, it's just that one guy. He's always, always begging. Have you ever had that? Same guy on the off-ramp, you see him all the time. The same guy that's right there on Guy and Meridian. That same guy that's right there by the bus stop in, in Ferndale. You, you know the guy, right? You've seen him. Maybe you don't even notice him anymore because he's been there so long. And you just drive by. He's been there so long. He's just part of the architecture. Let us never forget that that man or that woman has a soul, just like the lame beggar. So here we have the disabled man. He's just being brought in at this exact time. And he gets here to the gate, and it's this gate called Beautiful, to ask for alms. So he's laid here at this gate called Beautiful. Most scholars, well, they never agree on everything, but they disagree on which gate was the gate called Beautiful. They do agree that it was most likely on the east side, which is right here. My wife and I actually took this picture. This is a rendering. Uh, it's probably... 900, 1,000 feet by about 500 feet of just what Jerusalem would have looked like in 66 AD. This used to be showcased in a hotel, in the King's Hotel in Jerusalem, and they moved it to this museum that we got to go to. So this is a very well done rendering, and it aligns with all the other research that I've done. So most scholars agree that this would be the East Gate. Josephus, a first century historian, said that this gate would have been about 75 feet wide and about 60 feet high, overlaid in what's called Corinthian bronze. This, this door, this gate, would have had some serious bling to it, thus the name Beautiful Gate. It's also one of the primary entrances into the temple, which is why he would have been laying there. So this is where they have him. But let's just zoom in just a bit. So you have this beautiful gate, and you can see how there could be thousands of people surrounding this. If that door is 75 feet wide, it gives you an idea of the breadth of the temple. Okay? So here we have an invalid. He's unable to walk. And he's laying right here at this gate. He had to be carried everywhere that he went. And what was he doing? He was asking alms of those entering the temple. Alms is a, it's another word for money or goods. It could also be translated as pity. So I think either one would work. Probably wants some pity, probably wants some goods, probably wants some money, probably needs some food. See, the Jewish rabbis, they taught three very distinct pillars of the Jewish faith. First one is the Torah. It's an absolute pillar of the Jewish belief system. Okay? The second one was the worship of Yahweh. This is the second pillar of a Jewish faith. And the third one was piety, almsgiving, being generous to the poor. Three pillars of the Jewish faith. See, he was pretty smart because if he's sitting here by the temple gate, he's got some Jews who want to be good Jews, which is why they're going to the temple. And part of their pillars of their faith would, to be, would be to be pious and to be generous. And so here he sits, not able to go in, begging them for what they already have. And the, the text continues. It's pretty powerful. I'm hoping to paint you a better picture. But seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. So we know that God supernaturally brought him at this exact time. And he, we know that Peter and John came at this exact time. They're coming up to the temple. And he's sitting there by that door. And Luke paints such an articulate picture. I love, I love the way that he, he writes. People are walking in to go to prayer. Twice a day, we already talked about this. He's begging for money. These two guys would probably normally have maybe walked by him. I don't know. But there's thousands of people going in and out of the temple. And he sees them about to go in. And he does what he should do. This is what he does all day long. He asked them for a handout. Historians say that he would have sat there, literally laid there, with his hands up saying, alms. Alms, alms, all day long. Next person would walk in, he'd say, alms, alms, alms. Next guy would walk in, alms, all, all day long. This guy would be asking for their piety, asking for their gifts. So here he is begging for alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Luke, again, gives us a detailed picture. I just I love how, how he writes. See, they didn't flip a coin in his lap. They didn't throw him a buck. They didn't give him some pita bread with some hummus, as it's pronounced over there. They look at him. They made eye contact, which I'm going to guess, if he's like beggars in our day and age, they don't get a lot of. So they directed their gaze at him. Could you imagine that moment? Instead of somebody just chucking you a buck, all of a sudden they look at you eye to eye. 
all of a sudden your attention now, you guys are locked in. There's something going on here. They didn't ignore him as if he didn't exist. They stopped in their tracks and they stopped him in his. So here they are, eye contact, they're engaged. But see, kids, I don't want us to miss this. Just like Jesus, they reached out to the people that society rejects. Society has very little use for invalids. Elderly, we can go through the whole list of how we're not really doing what Christ would have us to do. But see, Jesus doesn't operate that way. Jesus says, I want you to go to the alleys and the byways, to the outcasts, to the underdogs, and I want you to show them my love. So ask yourself, is this something that you could maybe stretch yourself and grow a little bit in and not so much as go along with mainstream and and reject those that God has created? Imago Dei, in the image of God, he has created them male and female. There's nobody less than you. There's nobody better than you. You're just you. They're just them. So society may reject them, but Christians we don't. So what Peter and John are doing here looks a lot like Jesus. They were being obedient, to be sure, and he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. They're locked in. They've got the connection, eye to eye. He's expecting something. Maybe he's thinking, I got the silver tuna. I'm going to get something awesome here. I don't know what they're going to give me, but they're looking at me. Do you see how God's timing is perfect and that we should never, ever doubt it? This is what I do know, my kids. Jesus has been healing for thousands of years, and he's still doing it today. And we're about to read it right now. But Peter said, I've got no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter, again, spokesman. You got John by his side, right? Brothers in arms. Peter knows what this beggar is thinking. He knows what he's asking for. It was obvious. He said, give me alms. Give me something. See, there's a couple things going on right here. The beggar just revealed to us his physical poverty, right? And Peter and John just revealed to us their financial poverty. They were apostles, not philanthropists. They genuinely had no money. I know what it's like to be a missionary, and people expect you because you're white in a foreign country to have money. It's like, no, you don't get it. I don't have no money. They don't get it because they think that you would. He's looking at them like, give me some money. He says, we got none. What I, 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 silver and gold I do not have. He's being honest. He's not playing them off because he's got an extra money in the other pocket. And I love that we just got done studying in Luke, or from Luke in Acts chapter 2 about koinonia, to share everything, right? Well, they had nothing physical to share. They said, silver and gold I don't have. I, I don't got it. But what I do have, I give to you. See, we can't give what we don't have. So if Jesus is in you, you can give that. You can share that. But if he's not, you can't. He says, but what I do have, I'm going to give it to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Wow. Look at the guts that this would have taken I know we read it. We read the whole story. We're like, yeah, of course, it's Peter, big player in the first church. See, but there's something about this name that we have to focus in on. When the Jews realized that they were the ones that had killed Jesus Christ, they said, brothers, what shall we do? How did Peter respond? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and receive baptism and the forgiveness of your sins. You get the Holy Spirit, you get forgiveness, but you got to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. What is it with this name? See, notice it does not say, in the memory of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, in the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It doesn't say, in the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. What is it about this name? I want to do a cursory overview about this name. I just want to give you a sampling of this name. I got 10 things. I just pulled them arbitrarily. One, Jesus' name represents Yahweh. His name represents God the Father. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. 
All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. He represents God the Father. This name represents, number two, Jesus' name is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 3, 22, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form, right? Jesus just got baptized. The Holy Spirit descends upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. He says, God says, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. There's something about this name of Jesus Christ. Number three, Jesus' name is above all names. Therefore, God is highly exalted in Philippians 2, 9 and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's that name. We know that Jesus' name is salvation for those who believe. Acts 4, 12, and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's salvation in the name of Christ. Number five, Jesus' name is our link to God. John 14, whatever you ask in my name, Jesus says, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. This happens in his name. Another one, Jesus' name, his name alone makes the demons flee. His name does that. Luke 10, excuse me, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. I'm not done yet. Jesus' name is our salvation. Romans 10, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus' name brings healing. Acts 4.30, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus Christ. Jesus' name justifies us before God. 1 Corinthians 6, and such were some of you that you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in what? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Jesus' name, another one for you to chew on, is absolute power. Revelation 19. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. All power is in the name of Jesus. There's something about this name. He is our divine warrior and so much more. Kids, I know I've said it and I'm going to say it again. There is no greater name than that of Jesus Christ. When we do anything in Jesus' name, we align ourselves with Him. We align ourselves with His sinless life, His crucifixion, His resurrection, His ascension to heaven. We align ourselves with Jesus when we do things in His name. Peter calls on the name of Jesus to show this man the power of God. And notice too, this Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I love how Luke uses all those names. Jesus being His earthly name. Just like Joshua is my earthly name, given to me by mom and dad, that's my earthly name. There was a lot of Jesus at the time, so to be more specific, he's like, this is Jesus Christ. Anytime you see the word Christ, you're supposed to remember, oh, that was the anticipated Messiah. That's what Christ means. So now we've got Jesus, earthly name, Christ, to remember us, to remind us that he was the anticipated Messiah. And then to go one step further, he says, of Nazareth. So to not be confused with anybody else, this guy is from this little town, this little village. And everybody would have known who this guy was because when they crucified him, Pilate put what above his cross? Jesus Christ of Nazareth, King of the Jews. They would have known this guy's name. That's what Peter is doing this in. This is Peter and John not being God, but being obedient to God. See, because God does all the heavy lifting. We simply are his vessels. We are simply along for the ride. And we've got to know our place. Christianity is not about stuff. That's not the first thing he offered him. It's not about our wealth. That's not the first thing he offered him. Even if he had it, I guarantee you, that is not where Peter would have gone. It ain't about money. It's about Jesus' name and what he's done. I read a story this week about Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas was a priest in the 1200s. Phenomenal guy. You need somebody else to study. This guy, had he lived a pretty awesome, awesome life. And he's with Pope Innocent II, so the big dog, right? They're counting this large sum of money that they just got in. 
Pope Innocent II says to Thomas Aquinas, they can no longer say, silver and gold I do not have. Thomas Aquinas looks at Pope Innocent II and says, neither can they say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. We will never rely on money when we have Jesus. Powerful principle for us to grab today. We go to him first for everything. Not to our bank account, not to our health, not to our whatevers. We go to him first for everything. It's good to meet people's physical needs, absolutely. But if Jesus is in the front of it, if Jesus is in the center of it, then it's just social justice, and that's not what we're about. We're about Jesus justice. We're about helping people in Jesus' name, which is exactly what Peter and John are doing here. But I never want us to lose sight of why we're doing what we're doing. And look at 7. And he took him by the right hand, raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. This really happened. This is a factual historical event. Don't ever miss that in Acts because it almost seems too good to be true. No, this really happened. He says, I got no money. but what I do have, I'm going to give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, let's rise up and walk. Okay? And then he took him by the right hand. Luke, again, paints us this beautiful picture. And it should remind us instantly of Peter's, mother, Peter's mother-in-law. Do you remember this story? She's sick. She's in bed. And Jesus comes to her bedside. Peter's mother-in-law. Mark 1, and taking your hand. So Jesus extends his hand to his very own mother-in-law and raises her up. And the fever left her, and she began to wait on them. But see, Peter's just simply doing what Jesus did. He extended a hand. Peter's mother-in-law was healed. He saw Jesus do this. So what does Peter do? What Jesus did. That's who we emulate. That's who we copy. So if this is how Jesus did it, that's how we do it. So he's copying Jesus right here. Took him by the right hand and raised him up. I don't want to miss this. Look at the faith that Peter had to have on both of these accounts. I know, we read this and we're like, well, duh, it's Peter. No, this guy just denied Christ 55 days before this, denied even knowing him. This isn't some perfect saint. He's just like us, a guy chasing after Jesus, trying to get rid of the stuff in our life that doesn't look like him. So here's Peter exercising his very little faith that he has. Twice. First time by saying, I got nothing, but I'm going to give you Jesus because that's what I have. So get up and walk. First part of faith. The second part was doing something about it. It's one thing to pray it. It's one thing to declare it. It's a whole other thing to reach down and expect somebody to get up. So he's exercising his God-given faith. I'm sure at one point Peter had to have a moment where he's like, is that possible? Because historically, Peter didn't do this all really well. But yet God had proven himself over and over and over again to Peter. If he has proven himself over and over and over again to you, you need to walk in this confidence. And I'm not saying name it and claim it. I'm not talking prosperity. I'm not talking any of that stuff. I'm saying walking in the power of the Holy Spirit when he says, I want you to pray for that person and I want you to do it right now, you obey. Because that's what he's walking in. This isn't his own merit. This isn't his own idea. He probably has walked by this guy a myriad of times. We know that he was there every day. We know that Peter goes to the temple every day. So here he is obeying the Holy Spirit, not only by saying in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, but then doing something about it and reaching down and extending his arm to help him up. He was living on purpose. I don't know how else to put this. He was willing to risk his own reputation for Jesus. So kids, grab this principle. Regardless of the potential outcome, we obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I think as adults, we often count the cost before we obey. We may not want to admit it out loud, but I think we overthink things. And if we're honest, we get a prompting from the Holy Spirit, and we're like, well, was that the Lord? I don't know. What if this doesn't work? I don't know if the Lord really wanted me to pray for that person so I'm just going to not do anything. I don't know if the Lord wanted me to bless that person. I'm just going to, you know what? I'm not quite sure. Because what if? What if? Well, my encouragement to you is when the Holy Spirit lays something on your heart to do, you do it. Because then you're not, you, got no, you got no guilt. You don't feel bad. You did what you had to do. You do your part to obey. This is what Peter and John are doing. They're doing their little part. Peter didn't heal him. Holy Spirit did. Peter's simply the vessel, but he was being obedient. 
See, the results are not up to you. If God doesn't heal, that's not your fault. That was his choice. We do know historically there would have been beggars all around the temple. But Peter's not going to every one of them saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, now rise up and walk. He's not doing this over and over again. He went specifically to this guy because God said, that's who I want you to pray for. So it's him following the Lord, him walking in obedience and exercising the faith that God has given him. That's all we're asked of. That's all he's asking us to do. Walk, walk with him, follow him in obedience, exercise what little faith that we have, and just obey. Just obey. It's our job simply to respond. So don't miss the boat when God gives you a divine opportunity. And immediately, his feet and his ankles were made strong. Instantly. The way that the, the, the original language was, was written was to place all the emphasis on this was not a progressive healing. This was instant. Instantly, he was made well. So Peter and John, they acknowledge the man. They didn't just throw him money. They say, I don't, got not, I don't got no money, but I got Jesus. I'm going to give you that. In the name of Jesus Christ, now there's rise up and walk. They extend a hand. He's now healed, and they help him up. And immediately, his feet are better than mine. His ankles and knees have more cartilage than mine have. This guy is as healthy as a horse that's healthy. Because I don't think all horses are healthy, so I probably shouldn't use that statement. But you understand what I'm saying. This guy is immediately made well. His whole body, he's able to jump up. Because that's how God does things. He didn't have to learn to walk like a little baby where they crawl and they fall and all those things. This guy gets right up and all of a sudden he is made strong. He is made well. No excuses. There was no pills that did this. There was no surgeries. Immediately the Holy Spirit heals this man. Truthfully, there's some faith that needed to be exercised by the invalid, by the lame man himself. And we'll learn in two weeks from verse 16 that it says that he actually had faith to do this. He believed Peter and John that this could actually happen. So he also exercised the faith. And I know we'll look at other miracles where there was no faith on the other part of the person. I understand. But this one specifically, he also believed that God could do what he said he could do. And I believe that's a powerful principle for each of us here. Do you believe? Do you believe that God can do whatever he said he's going to do? Because if you believe that, let me ask you again. Do you believe that God can do whatever he wants to do in your life? If you believe that, your life has to reflect it. Because if you do, your life doesn't reflect it, you just lied to me. Because if you really believe that God can move supernaturally, that God can do all of these things, that God can work all of these things out, you're going to be like this. Okay, Lord, let's go. I'm living my life only for you. Let's go. So Peter and John, there they are saying, let's go, God. How do you want to play this out? So here this man is. Four decades of being an invalid. Four decades of having to have somebody help him everywhere he wants to go. Four decades, and instantly he is healed. How would you respond? Well, let's look at how he responded. And leaping up. He st I don't even know if we needed Peter's hand, but Luke made sure that we know that Peter's the one that extended it. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them walking and leaping and praising God. I'm going to call this a proper response to a healing. This man leaps up for the first time in his life. He wasn't probably acting all calm, cool, and collected. I don't know if he was like a newborn gazelle and they're like trying to figure out how to walk. But this guy leaps up and he's praising. He's so excited because of what God and what he just did. You can't blame the guy. And you know what? There's hundreds, if not thousands of people around there watching this whole thing go down. That guy is now dancing. That guy is praising. What is going on? Leaping up, he began to walk. I got to geek out. Just, just stay with me for a second. This is what is called a, an allusion to the Messianic age. The Messianic age is what Jesus Christ ushered in as the Messiah. This is a prophetic fulfillment. Okay, so we'll go back to Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah's prophesying about what Christ is going to usher in in the Messianic age. Isaiah 35, 5. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened. Isaiah prophesies, and then the ears of the deaf unstopped, and the lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue will shout for joy. This lame beggar is a fulfillment of prophecy from the prophet Isaiah from eight or 900 years before. Isaiah said this was going to happen. This exact same word that's used in the, in the Septuagint is used right here. 
And it's really awesome when you understand that only God could say something eight or 900 years before and then have it fulfilled right here. Because what we're in is called the Messianic Age. And Jesus is the one that brought it in. This is another reason why the Jews did not like Jesus. See, the Jews, with their idea for the Messianic Age is, is that there would be a time of peace. So the Jews are waiting for this. When they believe the Messianic Age begins is when there's no more war, no more swords, and nothing but peace. That's what the Jews are waiting for. But that's not this. See, because Jesus came to bring a sword, which is what? His truth. And our peace will happen when all is said and done. So this messianic age is a powerful, powerful concept. And Jesus started it. They're simply carrying it on. And it says here, and, the, and, the, and they entered the temple with him. You understand, he wasn't allowed in the temple as an invalid. If you had any sickness, any infirmities, if you were lame, he could only sit by that temple gate. He could never go into worship. That's as close as he could get. Do you know how hard that would be for a practicing Jew? They can't get any closer than that because they're not allowed in. Because the Jews said, if you're sick or have infirmities, you can't come in. But see, isn't this just like our God? I don't know, and I'm not going to do what's called eisegesis and put my own opinions in here, but I have to ask the question, laying as an invalid for 40 years, do you think maybe just once he had dreamed about being inside that temple? Maybe just once dreaming that someday he could go inside that temple and worship God? Isn't it just like our God to give us far beyond what we can even seek or imagine, what we can even think about? God has already lined up for us. For I know the plans that I have for you, he says, they're going to be for good. And for your welfare, not for harm. I've got good things coming for my kids. See, but we can't even dream that someday we'll be able to do this, this, or this. So here's this invalid for the first time in his life, realizing a dream, probably not even a realistic dream for him because he would have no hope of being healed. But God, see, but God, God made a way where there was no way, which is why he's now leaping and praising God. I'm pretty sure in the temple there was protocol and it probably didn't include leaping and jumping. They were very proper. And now here's this guy dancing a jig for Jesus. And he couldn't be more excited because of what he's just experienced. So now he's inside the temple with them for the first time in his life, for the first time in his life walking, and he's leaping and he's praying. See, Jesus started all this when he came and he started healing. The apostles are simply carrying on what Jesus started. question had to be asked by everybody who saw this. What is going on? Because this isn't normal. This isn't what they normally see when they walk into the temple and all the people saw him walking and praising God. This is what they're watching. And they recognize him as the one who, who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder. They were filled with amazement at what had happened to him. They were witnesses. So they have every right to ask the question. They have every right to be in amazement and wonder. See, I'm going to tell you right now, seeing is not believing. Because not everybody that saw this miracle believes that it was the hand of Jesus that did it. They're seeing it, but they don't believe necessarily that it's the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ doing this healing. So seeing is not necessarily believing. That doesn't mean they're not going to be awestruck and blown away by it. And it, that's what the text means. It's like they didn't have no words for it. This is too good to be true. Like, what is going on here? See, they recognized him as the one who sat at this gate called Beautiful, the beautiful gate, asking for alms. Everyone, I, I'm not kidding you. Wouldn't you just be scratching your head too? Like, this guy's dancing. He's leaping. He's praying. He's been laying in his own stuff for 40 years. And now here he is with us inside the temple. What's going on? And I love how Luke unpacks their reaction. Reaction: It was wonder and amazement. They, they, it didn't make sense to them. And that's the Holy Spirit at work. It doesn't have to make sense for God to get the credit. That's when God gets most of the credit. It's supernatural. And the, the response from this man, I, I don't know how I would have responded. My guess is probably similar. How would you have responded? No hope. Four decades Nobody even pays you much attention, except for the pious ones trying to hold to the three pillars of their faith. How would you have responded? For those watching, it was with wonder and amazement. So, let's just say that you were there, which you weren't, but let's say you were. 
would this have persuaded you enough to believe in this name of Jesus Christ? You hear a crazy story today. Let's say you hear a crazy story about a supernatural miracle. What is your response? Is it to leap up and praise God? Or is it to question it? Like, well, that must have had another explanation. Smoke and mirrors. Maybe that's just a story. Maybe they're embellishing to tell the story. How do you respond when you hear about the supernatural movings of God? Do you believe the story that I just read to you? That I preached to you? Do you, do you agree with this? And do you agree that this is still happening? Yes, so let us all be in wonder and amazement about what God is still doing. Knowing who the source of this power is. When our kids were little, my wife and I were convicted that when they get an owie, we would just throw some Neosporin on it, throw a Band-Aid on it, call it good. And all of a sudden we were convicted. It's like, why are we not praying over our kids? So as stupid as it might sound to you, our kids would get a little owie, and instead of just throwing the Neosporin and the Band-Aid on it, we would pray over them first. And then we would put the Neosporin and the Band-Aid on it. Why? Because Jesus is the one who heals, not the Neosporin. He might use it. Jesus is the one who heals, not the doctor. Jesus may use the doctor. Do you understand what I'm saying? We have to trust Jesus first and then put on the Neosporin. We have to trust Jesus first and then we can hand out. And then we can do all these other things because God is the healer. So for us here today, I want to challenge you to slow down with your life. I want to challenge you to start following the Holy Spirit even more. Because I think that if Peter and John were in a hurry, they would have blitzed right past this guy. I know, we got 168 hours in the week, we got 1,440 minutes, and every day it's up to us how we invest our time. I get it. But I think we need to slow down and start walking with the Holy Spirit just, just far more intentional so that we don't miss these opportunities, so we don't miss that guy who just needs to know that Jesus loves him. So we don't miss the opportunity to watch God move supernaturally. I want each of us here to get in the habit of extending a hand. Not with stuff. You can give stuff if you got stuff. That's great. But you're giving Jesus. Start extending that love to people that you encounter. We talked about it in the very beginning with Easter coming up. Do you not want people to be saved? Tell them your story. Tell them what Christ has done. Tell them the miracles that he's done in the past and what he's done in your own life. I don't want people to go to hell. So I feel like we have an opportunity to just help. I feel like we have an opportunity to just share the goodness of Christ and the power of that name. I think it's been abundantly clear through the text today that God's timing is absolutely flawless. God doesn't miss a beat. God's timing is perfect. So I don't know where you're at in your life right now. Maybe you're in a process that you're not real fond of. Maybe you're in a great spot. Maybe you're on top of the world. Maybe you're in a deep valley that's pretty dark and you really don't want to be there I'm telling you right now, you need to trust in God's timing. Come before His throne. Come before Him and trust Him. Trust Him. And part of this is us just being mindful about what God is doing. That's why we're told by God to pray without ceasing. That's how we walk in the Holy Spirit, right? We're walking with the Lord all day long. Regardless of the outcome, I want you to obey. I don't care if you look stupid. I don't care if it doesn't actually happen. That's not up to you. You don't decide who gets healed and who doesn't get healed. You simply decide to obey, regardless of what people think. And I get it. We live in a culture that doesn't really understand this. But I need each of you to start stepping out. I need you to start stepping out in faith and showing the powerful name and the love of Christ. That's up to us to do to a very broken, dying, hurting world that's looking for answers. We have them. You have the answers. It's up to us. But it comes, to, it comes down to just trust. It really does. I, again, Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than yours, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. We only see in part. We don't get the whole picture. That's why we not only got to trust his timing, but we put everything before him, everything. 
That's all he's asking. It's not much, if you think about it. He does all the heavy lifting. We simply just show up and we're like, okay, use me. What would you like? Okay, I'll talk to them. I'll pray for them. I'll help them. I'll serve them. I'll bless them in Jesus' name. And that's it. I can complicate it, but honestly, at the end of the day, that's what he's calling us to. The question is for each and every one of you, answer it honestly in your hearts. Do you really trust him? Trust him enough to look like a fool for him. Trust him enough to stand out in faith. Trust that he's going to catch you. I'm not sure where you're at today, but maybe you think that something else could help you. If you just had more money, I'd be fine. If I just had my health, I'd be fine. If I just had, if I just had, if I just had, you don't need any of that stuff. You just need Jesus. And he can help you do everything else. It's part of the unexpected journey. And it's part of us truly trusting him. In the beginning, the beggar wanted money. But that's not what he needed. God knew what he needed. He needed salvation and he needed healing. And God brought both. So we have to trust Yahweh, creator God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Pray with me. Yahweh, we, we come to you with gratitude. Gratitude that we have the freedom to meet and assemble. Gratitude that we get to learn about you, God. Gratitude that we get to read this text that you have supernaturally preserved for a couple thousand years to learn from. And God, I pray that our, our trust in you would go so much deeper today. That after reading this story and learning about all these things, about what you've started and what we get to carry on, God, that you have us right where you want us. Help us to trust you with everything in us and not hold anything back, not compartmentalize. Fully, fully, fully surrendering to you. God, I hope that my brothers and sisters can all say, I just give up. I just want you, Jesus. You're more than enough. And that we'd be able to walk in that freedom and in that power that only comes from you. And there's something about this name, Jesus. Something about your name changes everything. And so in that name, we pray. Amen.